Oh, there you go. All right. So um, we did have a week of, of prayer and fasting, and, and so last week I taught on that in our study, and if you didn't uh, hear that and you want to know more about it, um, a lot of resources out there. Uh, the message is also online. You can download it and, and, and watch it and all, but I tell you what, so from Sunday night we started praying. We had an hour-long prayer meeting, then Monday morning at 6 o'clock, Monday evening at 6 o'clock, and on and on. Uh, throughout the week, our Wednesday midweek service, we had an hour of prayer, and then we had a time of worship, and then a second hour of prayer on Wednesday night, and then we, we came to Friday evening, and I tell you what, if you want time to slow down, fast for an extended amount of time, and know that there's a bunch of food waiting for you, <laughs> and, and just in a few hours, you know, those last few hours, man, they felt like days, <laughs> and then we're, we're in here in our prayer meeting, and I'm sitting here just going, okay, I get to eat. <laughs> 29 minutes, 28 minutes, <laughs> you know, but uh, anyways, you got to be careful because you can make yourself sick if you fast and then eat too much, and I can testify, <laughs> but anyways, as we normally teach uh, verse by verse through the Word of God, so last week was a, a time of, of prayer and fasting, and then um, um, we're, we're normally, like right now, we're in um, Acts chapter 21, but normally we travel all the way through a book, but again, I felt like it was time, summertime, and, and just a, a, a God-ordained time to pray and fast. And again, we're just trying to sort out the results of it. I mean, it was just an incredible week. And um, there was probably at least 60 different people showing, showing up during the prayer meeting time. You know, in the morning, we never had less than 10 people show up at 6 a.m., you know, in the evenings we had uh, uh, up to 35 people showing up, you know, but, but over 60 different people were showing up and, uh, throughout the week, and, and it was just incredible. And, and again, you know, we as a church, I think church in America has become so many other things than what the Bible talks about, you know, and we're trying to figure out what church is really supposed to be. And it, the beautiful thing about prayer and fasting, it's mentioned so many times in the scriptures. And last week we were at the most fundamental, basic thing that a church does, and it was sweet. So I was really excited about that. At the same time for me, um, I fly out tonight, and I'm at a conference, and so I won't be here next Sunday, and I have a, a great uh, friend uh, from uh, south, or actually east San Antonio, and uh, he's going to be down, and he's just this fiery little black guy, man. And he's going to bring it. <laughs> so, Anton, if you guys were here last year, he actually came last year, and it'll be a blessing to have him. So, so I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be out, out at a conference. But I was telling somebody in the hallway just a few moments ago, it's like prayer and fasting and then a conference. I'm going to come back super pastor. I'm going to have a shirt, you know, super pastor. You know, <laughs> I'm just so excited about what God is doing. But keep on praying. Keep on praying because we've been moving in the right direction for for a long time in our church, and, and I, I really think this week was extremely impactful, and we're really s just trying to sort it out. So that being said, um, we're not going to go into the book of Acts, because I took last week off, and then I, then I would have taught in the book of Acts, and then I wouldn't be here the next week, and you know, so it's kind of sporadic. So we'll, we'll pick up the book of Acts um, a little bit um, the week after next. But what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at blind spots in our lives. And uh, if you would turn to Psalm chapter 39 with me. Psalm chapter 39, 139, excuse me, verse 23. And you won't ever have to turn there again after today because you'll have this memorized, okay? <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, just bless this time. And may it be, even as we prayed for repentance upon ourselves and upon the church and the churches in this city, that we may be absolutely right and powerful before you, God. May this today be another important step for all of us to humble ourselves before you and to realize you care so much about us that you will continually work on us, Lord. Because we know when you heal a part of our life, when we surrender it back to you, that our joy is more full and we're more prepared for eternity. 
And we're such a better servant unto you, and we're such a better tool of yours into other people's lives, God. And so may it be that this be one of those big steps that we can take in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 139, verse 23, David writes, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so the question would be, why would David ask God to search his heart? Why would we ask God to search our heart? Well, the reason we would do that is because we don't know ourselves as well as God knows us. And sometimes we got things going in our life that everybody around us is seeing, but we aren't seeing. We're not comprehending, right? And, and it's a blind spot. And the reason we call it a blind spot, because it's a blind spot, right? You ever been driving down the freeway and you go to change lanes and you put on your blinker and everything? And, and you look at your mirror and then you move over and someone starts honking at you and looking at you like you're the devil, right? <laughs> And in all reality, what happened is you fell into a blind spot. You didn't see it, and you're shocked that that car was there, right? And sometimes in our lives, when the Lord searches and reveals something in us, we're shocked that that thing was actually there. Now, why does David want to know those blind spots, those anxieties that cause him not to walk close to God? Now, it would be a bummer to be searched out by God if you didn't want to be, right? And, and sometimes, every so often, we get caught doing something that we shouldn't be doing, and it's a bummer that we got caught. But if you're into righteousness, you're actually kind of relieved and glad that you got caught, so now that you can deal with it in honesty, right? Right? I mean, some of you guys know what that's like. Others of you are better than the rest of us and don't know what it's like, you know. But, but you get caught, and sometimes it's a relief. But it's not a relief if you just don't care. But if you actually care about who you are in your inner being, it's a relief to get caught. But it's even better when, when God uses people and God uses circumstances to reveal that so that you can take action on your own. And so Paul asks, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me. And fix me. Lead me in the way everlasting. And so what happens when God searches our heart and leads us in the way everlasting. Number one, we grow closer in intimacy to him. One of the, the things, and Glenda said it uh, a few weeks ago during worship, she said, old love is the best love because you have grown to, to know and understand each other, but you have also, um, you know what, Alex, come up here. I forgot to pray for you. Come on up. <laughs> I looked over there. I go, oh, there's Alex, and I forgot. <laughs> So we'll cut this out of the video feed, unless you want to leave it in there and be all famous. <laughs> I am mad I blew it. <laughs> but anyway, so this is one of our Coasties, and I like Coasties, okay? <laughs> because my, my son-in-law is a, is, a, is a Coast Guard guy. But one of the things about Alex is, is um, you know, when, when someone shows up, and I don't know if I haven't told you this, but he showed up at our house for, was it Thanksgiving or for Easter? Easter. Easter. Yeah. yeah. So he showed up, like, when he first got in town, like, four years ago. And it's like, okay, all these people show up. There's food, right? He's a young man. Food, where I'm going to be there, right? And uh, so several, several of, of his, his friends showed up, and, and Brooke had invited a lot of them over to our house, you know? And it was just a neat time. We love young people, you know? And, and, and sometimes you just go, Lord, I hope they make it. I hope there's some consistency here. And, and, and he hasn't been the most consistent person. But the thing is, over time, he's become more and more consistent. And we had a real good talk about two weeks ago. And, and God is really doing something in his life. You know, so I've been watching him over the, really over the last year, right? Just a lot of consistency. We'd see him, you know, uh, 
pretty consistently, but just been a lot more consistency. And God is doing something awesome in his life. And so when we found out that he's going to be stationed somewhere else, I was like, oh, man, we got to pray you out of here because we want to hear the rest of that testimony. We got to be the beginning of the story of a making of a man of God. You know, and, and so that's why I wanted to bring him up here. And, and what a blessing. And, uh, and he's just real, real open heart. So, so when God gets a hold of an open heart, you know, he's going to be able to be a stand-up guy to the rest of the guys. And believe you me, I mean, the, the Coast Guard seems all chill and mellow, and it's, you know, maybe compared to the Marines, it is, you know. But those guys j- need just as much saving as anybody else, right? And, and so um, we're going to send him out as our missionary. So let's go ahead and pray for him. Dear Lord, we just uh, lift him up to you, your son, Alex, to you, God, and just pray that you'd bless his socks off as he moves forward, God. And Lord, he is a man. By all rights, he is a man. And Lord, may many young recruits and many of those, even non-rates and, and those um, around him, Lord, may they see him as a mentor. And may he take on that responsibility, God. And I would say especially spiritually, Lord, as they look to him, Lord, may he point them to you that you may lead them in the way everlasting, Lord. And so I just lift them up, Lord, pray that you fill them with your spirit, Lord, that he may have your power to be that witness moving forward, Lord. So just do that work, do that work that he so desires right now in his life, Lord. And we just pray that that momentum would move forward, Lord, and that we would hear of great things that you're doing in his life as he he continues in his walk with you, Lord. So just bless him, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, man. (laughs) God bless him. (laughs) That's what you get when your pastor has severe ADD. Sorry about that. (laughs) Anyway, so... This whole idea, what happens when you allow the Lord to search those deep things and get in? Number one, we we grow closer in intimacy with him. And as as you're married, old love is good love. You know why? Because you've endured through those things and you've learned to stop to do those, stop doing those things that harm your spouse. And you started to learn how to do those things that do please your spouse. And so if you endure through that, you get to this place where the intimacy, I'm not talking about all the energy and passion. Are you kidding me? (laughs) We get older. But I'm talking about the depth of intimacy where you know that person, they know you. You have the keys to their heart. They have the keys to your heart. You're avoiding the pitfalls and the things that, that you fight over, you know, and, 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 and you draw an intimacy. The same is with God. The only, the only thing in your relationship with God, you're the one that's always wrong. <laughs> you can't point your finger at him, right? But you learn yourself. And so you have greater intimacy with God if you allow your heart to be searched, right? And, and as you're, there's less static in the line, you're just closer to him. Two, we experience how to be more like him as we become more like him. Lord, search me, know my ways. Uh, correct my ways. Make me more of what you created me to be before sin attached me. And the less sin that you have in the life, in your life, the more in character you become like Christ because he was sinless, right? Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed into what? The image of his son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Conformed into the image of his son. That's what the Lord wants to do in us as we allow him to search us, as we allow him to challenge us, as we invite him to to challenge our lives. I learned something as a young Christian. I used to, you know, love to go to a bunch of different churches. And I loved it when the pastor would challenge me. Because I felt like it was a waste of time unless I was challenged. Like, why did I come? Just to feel better or to change, you know? And so we used to sit out in in the congregation. And we used to go to Greg Laurie's church a lot. and, And during the week, instead of just evangelism, he would be teaching the scriptures. And we'd sit there and we'd lean over, Boom! You know, like he nailed me, you know, and we'd have all these, these bomb lobbings on our heads, right? And, and so we'd laugh about that, but it was true. And, and it is good to be challenged, and it's certainly good to be challenged directly by God to your heart. Next we see we end up understanding his love for us more 
because as, as we get to know him and as, as, as he allows us or as we allow him to search our heart, the thing is he never gives up on searching your heart because he loves you so much. Listen, if I know your kids, I love your kids. And I would encourage them to do well. But my kids, I put pressure on them because I love them so much intimately and I have that responsibility for them. And the thing is, the reason why God doesn't let off of you sometimes is because he loves you so much. And, 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 and you expect so much out of those that you love, don't you? And God loves you, right? And, and so you end up realizing over time that he never lets up. Yeah, I've been walking with the Lord since I was eight years old. I had a few years of backsliding in there, okay? But I'm 27 now. And um, <laughs> it's not that funny. But anyway, so, I mean, I, I can't, I'm not even going to try to do the math. Uh, it's been a long time. I've been walking with the Lord. And, and some of those things are obvious, but some of them aren't so obvious. And I still have things that I'm working on every single day. But what I realize is the more mature I grow as a Christian, the less I overtly sin, but the more I am aware of my sinfulness. And so when I got saved, I was a mess, but I thought God got a prize. Now I've been cleaned up, but now I realize God really had to sacrifice because I'm a radical sinner, right? And, and, and so I learn more about myself, and so I'm more humbled. My view of myself is lower. But I also learn more about God's glory and his perfection as I study him more and experience him more and his goodness all the more. And so God becomes greater in my sight. And so instead of me thinking, oh, God, he's cool. He's my homeboy. And God, you got a prize when you, when you saved me. You know? and, and so I'm thinking this gap in between here is what the cross had to cross. It had to stretch across that and create a bridge between me and God, right? Jesus loved me this much. That's, how, that's the sin he had to die for. But in all reality, it's a lot more. But I come to understand as I mature in the Lord and I allow him to convict me in my deepest, darkest sins, I realize how awesome he is. And I realize what a loser I am. And, and, and then I realize, oh my gosh, this gap that Jesus had to, had to cover with the cross is wider. And that gap is love. And the older I grow, the more I understand how much God loves me. But it comes from realizing who I am and who he is. Right? And that comes through conviction. It comes from being challenged. So we end up love, understanding his love for us more. We also grow closer in intimacy, not only with God, but with others. Because when God convicts you about selfishness and me, me, me-ness, right? And it's all about me. He, he, what happens is we start to become less selfish. And we, bec we start to become more servants to one another. And we start to consider others' needs as greater than our own. And if you start doing that, people are actually going to like you more. They're going to trust you more. They're going to call you in times of need. And you're going to grow in closeness to other people once you start putting away those sinful things. There's more desire to love and serve and learn about each other. It's not all about you. It's about him. And, and then you, you love God, you love each other, and then you love a lost and dying world. James 4.1, or 4, 1, where do wars come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cut, cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And so there's this selfishness that says, I want, I want, I want. And you know what? The most selfish people are the most unhappy people, always. You guys know any selfish people that are actually happy? They're not, are they? And have you guys ever met anybody that just kind of serves everybody and they're really happy? Yeah, like every single person that's like that, right? And there's just this joy in their heart. It's like, I want the key to that. And the key to that is it, it, allowing the Lord to transform you, to humble you, to challenge you. And uh, next, we're able to better follow God's plan or agenda for our lives as we learn to say, not my will, 
but thine be done. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. And, and that comes with the conviction and the humility of allowing God to break down those sins in your life. And we live our lives in peace with God, confidence in his plans and an assurance of his redemption. You know, I remember being a young Christian and sometimes I would doubt, am I really saved? You know, well, God is able to save me regardless of my feelings, right? But I hated feeling that way because I would blow it radically all the time. But I tell you what, when you walk and you're plugged into that vine and it's obvious that you're plugged into that vine and every so often you might step off the path and we still sin. But to know the intimacy of God through allowing him to refine you so that you're intimate with him over time through that conviction and that repentance and, and, and that closeness. And, and there's such a radical peace. And, and I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just saying that this is a result of walking with God consistently and allowing him to work on your heart over time is you really stop doubting in God's ability to save you. And that is such a good place to get to. But I remember being a young Christian, even being on staff at a church and just going, I'm such a loser, I can't even believe you, you know, <laughs> that you, you saved me, you know, and, and just... But now I, I know I'm a loser full time all the time, but the same thing, at the same time, over this time, I no longer doubt God. And there's been tragedy and trial in my life like everybody's life. But the older I get, even though the trials and the tragedies are more radical, there's so much less doubt. Actually, I haven't had that doubt because this is just a result of being able to draw close to God through intimacy with him, through his sanctification, working through our lives. And we could go on and on and on. So saying, God, here I am. Here I am, God. Search me. And do what? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Ooh, okay, I'll let you in. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So again, we can be totally blind to what needs to change in our lives. We don't know in our heart, but oftentimes we'll see the effects of sin all around us, and we tend to blame other people for that effect instead of looking at ourselves and going, am I causing that? The idea of deceiving ourselves is not foreign or rare in the scriptures. James, or excuse me, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Our own hearts can deceive us, right? We can be radically wrong and think we're radically right. Because our heart is deceitful above a few things. No, that's not what it says. It says, our heart is deceitful above all things. And then James 1, But be doers of the word and not hearers only. What? Deceiving yourselves. We can deceive ourselves. James is warning us. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. So God tries to speak to us, and then we kind of ignore it, or we just walk away, and we like to forget it, and we like to give ourselves all this incredible self-esteem. You're a sinful, deceitful human being, <laughs> and we're trying to build up our self-esteem. Hard thing about me, like my self-esteem, like me really picking myself up, I know I'm a liar, <laughs> you know, so how can I believe me? You know, but when God approves of me and God loves me and he tells me that he loves me and he has a plan for me and that he can use me, I can believe him over me every time. So we can deceive ourselves. And the scriptures speak of this many, many other places as well. Now, some things are obvious targets for change. Let's just say I'm married and I just got saved. And it says, husband, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's not an ooey-gooey feeling. It's like he committed to the church and he was willing to die for the church, right? So you're a brand new believer and you read that and it's in the scriptures and it's clear. Well, maybe you should stop beating up your wife and maybe you should get rid of that woman on the side. <laughs> you know, I mean, 
duh, like it's obvious, right? The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Maybe you need to go into a recovery program because being drunk is clearly a sin. So there's obvious things. We see them and others see them. But other things aren't so obvious, and that's why David has to pray. What does he pray? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so before I nail you, let me share, uh, share with you how God has nailed me. So early on in marriage, you know, my, my wife is an A personality. I'm like a D minus personality, right? It's like we, we, we opposites attract, attract so often, not always, but, but very often. But I realized that I was harming my wife because what I was doing was I, I was couching anger and bitterness in jokes and sarcasm. And, and you guys need to know, I was hiding it from myself. I was just being funny. But women have superpowers. Because <laughs> men, have you ever said the right thing with the wrong heart and your wife just nailed you? All I said was, and they're looking at you like, no, I heard everything you said. I know exactly what you meant, you know? And so they have this superpower that you never get away with it, right? But I was harming my wife, but I was, I was claiming innocence. But what was happening, instead of being honest with her and confessing with her or talking to her about the issue, I was jabbing her and I was stabbing her with, with, with a thousand, you know, pinpricks uh, of just jokes and sarcasm that had a little bitter edge to them. And I had to repent of that. Now, I still joke with my wife, but I have to be very careful. And I've developed a saying for myself that it's better to be kind than funny. And I need to remember that. It's better to be kind than funny. And you better believe, after 29 years of marriage, my wife says amen to that one. A verse that God gives me a lot. Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it might impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so I was hiding this bitterness, this wrath, this anger, this clamor, this evil speaking in my coarse jesting. And the Lord had to reveal it to me. It was a, it was a blind spot to me. There was another blind spot that really hindered my ministry as a, as a pastor, my service as a pastor. You see, if you're apathetic, you can hide a lot of things. You know, it's, you're cool, you're chill. I'm underreactive. If you say something radical to me, I'm just going to look at you for a while and just figure out what to say, and I don't overreact. I underreact. You know, I've been a lifeguard. I've trained lifeguards. I've saved people uh, plenty of times or whatever, but if someone is drowning, I don't panic and run and then go, oh, I forgot my board or I forgot the, the dinghy or I forgot the, the lifeguard tools that I need to save somebody. I'm, I'm like, I look and I go, I assess the situation. I start to think about it and then I prepare and I go, right? So I'm underreactive instead of overreactive. But it allowed me to hide some, some sin in, in, in my life. And... In the ministry, and again, I've been in ministry in leadership positions for 30 to 31 years now. And, and over the years, people would resent me and hate me. And, and some of them I knew why, because they didn't like the rebuke or whatever. Others I harmed, and I tried to apologize, and they still don't like me. But other times, people were resentful towards me, and I'd be looking back like, what's your problem? Jeez. You know? What's your problem, bro? I'm cool, peace, love, and granola. That's my personality. What's not to love, you know? And that was kind of my attitude towards so many things. 
And I didn't understand it. But then a trial developed in my life, and God was telling me to let go of a certain staff member, and so I needed to do it, and I followed through on doing it. And what happened with me in that kind of style of being underreactive, he was upset with me, understandably. And uh, what happened was he's trying to communicate to me how he felt after I let him off of the staff and he was still in the church. And I'm looking at him going, you're so angry, bro. What's the problem? And he's trying to tell me, and I'm like, I don't know. But what ended up happening was my blind spot was an apathy. And, and as we struggled with this, because me and this staff member had been friends since we were children, and now we weren't friends. And we're trying to fight for this friendship, and we have this, this animosity, him towards me, and I'm doing my, what's up, bro? What's your problem? So he's angry, and I'm like, what's up? You know, I mean, it's just this weird contrast. And, 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 and we finally figured it out because he would not give up on our friendship. What happened, and if you're in ministry, this happens. What happens in ministry is sometimes you have to hurt people's feelings by rebuking them or challenging them, in this case, letting him go off of staff. And they're going to be mad at you but I'm still their pastor, so I can't abandon them either, right? I have to press back in. But for me, my defense mechanism is not anger or getting mad at you or getting back at you. My defense mechanism oftentimes is, eh, I go apathetic, and I'm not allowed to do that. And so what happens is, even if someone is upset with me, I will follow up with that. And follow up on them and say, are you okay? And I tell you what, this has been revolutionary over the last six to eight years in the ministry here in this church. Because I know I have to press back in. It's like your, your, your parent punishing you in the sense that I had a spiritual authority in their life. And then they ignore you for the rest of your life. That's not right, is it? And that's the same type of thing we, I experienced. But... Until I acknowledged it, I wasn't free from that, that struggle. And I tell you what, once I acknowledged it and we figured it out, he was free to go off and pastor and plant it. And this day, we're great friends. And we talk to each other probably on average once a week. You know, and it's incredible what God did bring in that healing. And so even if there's tension between me and someone that I'm ministering to, I have to follow up. Because it's really easy for me to go, eh, they're mad at me, I'll just get out of the way. Sounds good to me, you know? And so these are blind spots. These are two major blind spots, and God is working on them all the time in my life because I pray this prayer a lot. God, search me, right? You, you search me, you know my heart, you try me, you know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting, Biblical examples of blind spots. You had this young man named John Mark. John Mark would travel with his uncle. You guys know who his uncle was? Barnabas. His name was Josies, but Barnabas was son of encouragement. He had a nickname from the big apostles, man, because they looked at, at Barnabas and they called him, you're, you're such a son of encouragement. And so we know him as Barnabas in the scriptures. That was John Mark's uncle. Most likely, the Last Supper was in John Mark's house, you know? And, and so he knew Jesus. He knew all the disciples. He was there. He saw the cross. He saw the resurrected Christ. He was voted in his high school yearbook the one most likely to succeed spiritually. That was the man. But he had a blind spot. His blind spot was he was riding on his accolades. He was riding on what other people thought of him instead of who he really was in Christ. And so then he thought, oh, I can go on this mission trip with, with Paul and my uncle Barnabas. And I'll, I rock, man. You guys are so blessed to have me on this trip. And when push came to shove, when it got just the least bit hard, what did John Mark do? He bailed. Because he had a blind spot. You see, 
what people say about you really doesn't matter when you get in a true trial because the one that has to meet you in that trial is Jesus. And he was living on everybody's opinion of him as opposed to his intimacy with God. It was his blind spot. And you know what? It was revealed. But what happened later on in, in, in John Mark's life was he was restored. So Barnabas restored his nephew. Paul would not let him on a mission trip. But what happened was Barnabas did what Paul would write about. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. And so Barnabas saw that his nephew had this blind spot, and what did he do? He quit the front line, the popular trips of Paul. He kind of disappeared off the face of Acts, but he didn't disappear from ministry because he restored his nephew in a spirit of gentleness. The Gospel of Mark was written by John Mark. <clears throat> Think that's a little restoration? Right? He became Peter's assistant, and would the, the book of Mark, it's believed, is Peter's gospel, actually, but Mark got to write it. Probably a little better writer than Peter. <laughs> you know, Peter doesn't seem like a bookworm to me. He's a burr, you know? And then later on, he gets restored. So it took a trial to reveal it, and it took someone else to help restore him. And so what ends up happening in John Mark, he got beyond his black mark, right? Paul, the guy who had split up the team in division because Paul didn't want to bring John Mark on his second mission trip, and Silas went instead of Barnabas. The last, some of the last words we have from Paul are in 2 Timothy 4, 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly, Timothy. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. How cool is that? But through a trial... And through his uncle's willingness to pour into his life, and I dare say Mark allowing his uncle to minister to that blind spot was completely restored. So there's blind spots throughout the scriptures, guys, that we can see and point out. And so whether it be someone coming to us, whether it be just the reaction that God reveals it to us, or whether it be trials, they can reveal blind spots. James 1, 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may perfect, be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now this word, the testing of your faith, what did David write? Lord, he said, God, search me and know my heart. Try me, right? Now, that's in Hebrew, but this is in, um, in the common Greek. Try me, test me, and know my anxieties. And so you count this joy that it's an opportunity for you to grow. And many times it's through trials. It is an ouch. Guaranteed, it's an ouch. It hurts, guys. But you've got to be willing to hurt to move forward so often. You've got to be willing to humble yourself. Is being humbled fun? No. Okay, that's the right answer. Thank you. <laughs> All of us men for certain know that being humbled is not fun. It's against our nature to be humbled, right? Being humbled is not fun. Is being humbled good? It's always good, isn't it? Because now you're useful. Now there's more power in your life. And so trials often reveal it. 
Now, I've seen this many times in the 21 years at this church and, again, 30 years in ministry leadership. There's a time when someone came to our church that had great potential. He started to grow into leadership positions. And I did my due diligence. I didn't want to trust him right off the bat, but I called up his former pastor. And this is what we do. You know, if you start to grow in your authority, we'll say, well, what church did you come to? Psst, psst. I don't just want to know your history. I want to know if you caused any problems in your former church, <laughs> you know? But there's wisdom in that because so often we can give authority to someone and then they can misuse it. And we're trying to protect you, okay? But his pastor said this, when he thinks he's right, he really thinks he's right. I'm like, okay, well, what does that really mean, you know? But I soon discovered what that meant. You see, he, we had a few run-ins and disagreements, and, and he would rant, and his voice would raise. He wouldn't yell, but he would rant, like not stop. You guys know people like this, right? And they don't stop, and it's like, and you feel like you're being beaten down. Like, stop, okay, I get it already. I'm not dumb, I hear you. You know, like, you just have to tell me once, and you can use your inside voice, you know? And, and it, it's that feeling, right? And men, you need to understand this. When you just raise your voice to a woman or to, to, to daughters or whatever, it sounds like you're yelling. And they'll say, well, stop yelling. And you always go, I'm not yelling. This is yelling. This is how I was talking to you. You know? <laughs> like we, you know? But the thing is, we represent strength to God, so we've got to be careful about that. And so when he would do it to me, it wouldn't affect me. But then... He, he did it to a few women in our church. And when he did it to my wife, you guys know my wife, that ain't going to cut it, man. <laughs> you know, you know, that is not going to work. And the thing is, I saw his potential in ministry, but I saw this, to me, a glaring thing that would hold him back from deeper ministry. Not that God would not use him, because God uses us in all our faults. But I'm thinking, he's going to hit a ceiling. He's only going to be able to get so far, and, and, and then people aren't going to trust him or want to receive from him, right? And, and that's a bummer. And so I brought it up, you know, a couple times, just kind of lightly, but he really didn't see it. I'd already know, knew what blind spots were, right? And so actually, I had to be patient with this classic blind spot. Now note, if, if you had talked to him, you would have noticed anything until you came to that point, his trigger, that sent him on that rant, right? So ultimately, you know, he kind of stayed at the same level that he was, but since I was his leader, it affected my relationships with those who had been on the other side of that, thinking that I endorsed that style of ministry, And people respond differently to these things. For me, if you do that to me, I'm going to go, dude, what's your problem? Underreactor, right? If you do it to my wife, she's going to react. And <laughs> she's going to say, oh, no, you don't. Others will blame me instead of confront him. Others got offended. Others may have secretly left the church. Others may have loudly left the church. But it was a big deal in his life, and he either needed to receive correction or else I was going to have to remove him from ministry. It got that serious. And I was at least going to have to keep him from greater responsibility in the church. So I watched and I noted this happening over time, and eventually I sat down with him when I thought that I could convince him that there was a problem and enough evidence, as it were, to convince him that he actually had a blind spot. And remember, I'd gone through this in my own life multiple times. I'd gone through it in other people's lives with them as their pastor calling out their blind spot and having to be patient with them. So I knew exactly what was going on. And I also knew that I had to approach this in a spirit of humility. What happens when we're attacked is we push back and we fight back, right? What happens when someone approaches you that you know loves you in a spirit of humility? You at least have to listen. Your pride might tell you, 
I heard you, but I'm walking away from this, right? Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That spirit of humility is so important. All week long, last week, when we were praying as a church, we would, we would, we would praise God, and then we would repent. We'd first repent for ourselves, and then for the church as a whole. The amazing thing is, when you repent first, you're now in a place to call on God to help other people to repent. If you just look outside of yourself, you're judgmental. If you repent first, you have a heart of compassion for those that you're asking God to help repent. You see what the difference is? And, and, and you're so much more effective. And so I had to approach in a spirit of humility. So I'll give you guys a little bit of an outline on how I help others. And again, I'm a pastor. It's kind of my job. You know, <laughs> this is what I do. You know, and the, the funny thing is, with me, since I am like a C-minus type personality and I don't overreact, I underreact, God oftentimes brings intense men into our ministry for me to train. And when I haven't taken God up on that, when he's brought people into this church, they've turned around and eventually attacked me like ravenous wolves and tried to split the church. And so it's kind of like, oh, great, thank you, God. I just want peace, love, and granola. Let's go surfing after church kind of thing. And what God does in our ministry is he brings us sometimes intense people so that they can learn to chill out a little bit, right? You know, and so this was kind of a, a, a classic thing. And, and this is kind of my, my, um, my example for you guys, right? So, one, I have to love people enough for them to hear me. So this person knew I was committed to his maturity and that I had his best interest in, part, or in heart. I wasn't just trying to fix him because he bugged me. It wasn't selfish, it was for his good because I knew he loved people, and if this kept him from ministering in a deeper way to people, he wanted to get rid of it, and he should get rid of it, right? So it was for his good, not just for my pleasure. I didn't like it, but I was whatever, you know, like, what's your problem, bro? You know, and that's who I was. But I knew this would stop him from going deeper in ministry, right? I had to have his best interest at heart. And then I, ha I had to, or when this happens, I have to clearly identify the issue and bring evidence that is irrefutable. A blind spot is called a blind spot for a reason. And if you just go, I kind of feel like you're doing this. Well, can you give me an example? And no, I just kind of feel it. Oh, what do I do? Thank you so much for pointing this out. I know I bug you now, and I don't know why. Right? I mean, that's what it ends up being unless you're able to specifically point it out. What did I do? What did I say? Can you give me some examples of what's going on in my life? Okay? And with him, this was very strategic in this certain situation. I had eight things written down and eight examples of when he did it and eight of the examples of the results of when he did it. People and situations so he could specifically remember those situations. And so the first one I brought up, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. The second one, like, huh. By the third one, he started crying. I, I didn't have to get through all eight, but I wanted to because I wanted to pulverize. No, just kidding. <laughs> you know, no. I didn't even have to get there because the person's heart was right. The person's heart was right. And he started crying, oh my gosh, I've hurt people, and I never intended to hurt people. I just want to help people. So all of a sudden, now this blind spot is no longer a blind spot. Now it's a conviction that needs to change. You guys understand how that works? So I didn't have to go through all eight, but I had to clearly identify or else we can deny, right? What else? I have to come with scripture or scriptures to help guide their way forward. I don't want people to conform to my morality or my personality or my behavioral preferences, but to God's morality and good behavior, right? Because so often we have an opinion and it's not scriptural. So often we think people are in sin, but it's just something that bugs us and maybe the sin's in us, right? 
But so often, this is what we do. You're a bad person because you bug me. Really? Is there a scripture against that? Now, if I bug you because I cuss you out every day, yeah, that might be a problem, right? Or if I bug you for other reasons, like I'm stealing from you, or because I put you down, or I coarse jest, or whatever it is, there's reasons, there's biblical reasons that you can point to. But just because you don't hit it off with someone doesn't mean they're in sin, right? And so you bring scriptures that point them in the proper way, right? And, 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 and to help guide them to God's goals for their life. It's not your judgment upon them that matters. It's the word of God transforming people's lives that ultimately matters, right? And this is very important because I've been rebuked multiple times and I'm like, what did I do? And there's no scripture. I have to be willing to stand by their side as they learn to see their newly revealed blind spot healed. You pray for them. You're willing to say, hey, you blew it. You're getting there, or I'm watching this happen. You encourage them. You lift them back up when they fail because it doesn't all of a sudden go away. If it's a lifelong practice, if it's your self-defense mechanism that you're trying to change, you're going to fail again. But you need someone beside you to pick you back up, or you need to be that, that person willing to be in their life to pick them back up. And then you rejoice with them when they succeed. So the end result in this process is this person was restored and able to continue in ministry and authority. So again, the evidence sunk in. They repented. This particular person wanted to have that list of events that took place, got the list of all eight from me, and by the end of the day had called every single person on that list and apologized. There's a little repentance there, right? Let's take action. But the action was laid out. I didn't tell them to do that. But the, but, but, but the change was laid out clearly so that they could actually change, right? Awesome. He had scriptures to guide him and continued to catch or to collect scriptures that guided him for years. He was more humbled than before. And this sin became less and less and less over time. And so there was a process, it took patience, prayer, confrontation, restoration, and rejoicing. Now, does this always succeed? No. Let me tell you another time it succeeded, and I'll... I'll, uh, I'll pick on someone you might know, Rich Miotti. <laughs> He's a pastor of one of our church plants out in Portland. Sometimes he teaches when I'm out of town. So Rich liked to uh, smoke cigars and, and drink beers when they were having women's Bible study in his house. <laughs> so he'd go out into the garage. He wouldn't get drunk, you know, but uh, he had these Epicurean delights, Right? <laughs> So he wanted, to, he wanted to start our youth ministry. And uh, I said, you know, I, I love you, man. You're great. I love having you in the church and everything. And I know you don't smoke cigars all the time. And, and I know you're not an alcoholic. I know you're not out there getting wasted. You're lifting weights, drinking beer, and smoking cigarettes, which is kind of weird. Like, it's like, <laughs> you know. So I sat down with him, and I said, listen, I don't want to be legalistic on you. But in our church, probably at least half of our congregation at any given time had a problem with alcohol. I, I told him, I go, I don't drink. I haven't for 32 years. Because I know my position now. I, I have no desire to be drunk. I could drink a beer and not get drunk. But I do know that many of you have dealt with substance abuse in the past. And so I'm not even going to begin to say, oh, my pastor drinks. I can drink again. Because I've seen too many people that have quit drinking and then they drink again and then they get, you know, they get into it and it becomes a habit and I've watched them get divorced multiple times. I've seen women with black eyes come into my office with men that were good men who got drunk and they got in a fight and he's punched his wife. Because what does it do? It lowers your inhibitions. Which is great if you haven't had a great night of sex or whatever, you know, but it's horrible if you get in a fight. And how many of you plan to get in a fight? 
You know, so it's something I just like, dude, I love you. God has a big plan for your life. You're not going to be able to go any further in ministry if you continue this, you know, and uh, it's not a good example to kids to be smoking and, you know, bringing this into your body. And yeah, you might have a cigar once every two or three months or whatever, you know, but it's not a good example because a lot of people get addicted and it kills them, right? And he wanted to work with the youth. And you know what? I just told him once, prayed for him after that, but I pointed it out. This is something you don't realize it's holding you back. He didn't, talk, he didn't talk to me specifically about it for six months, and he came back to me and said, I'm ready. And he got rid of it, and he started our youth ministry, and he was a great youth minister for years. You know? And, and it was just like, I'm, I love you enough, and it's not for my good, it's for your good. Rich, you want to minister to people you want to minister to people, you need to get rid of these habits. You need to either choose ministry or your Epicurean delights, right? And, and so he did, and, and that was a great success. But listen, is it always successful? Has it always succeeded? Absolutely not. It takes three to tango, the helper, the helpy, and the Lord, right? So if the Lord and the helper are on, on the side of trying to help the helpy and he doesn't want to be helped, forget it. It isn't going to happen, right? If you don't include the Lord in it, he's just trying to please you, but you're not the Lord, so you can't give him the joy in the future that he needs. So if it's just you and him without the Lord involved, that ain't going to work either. And sometimes we say, oh, God, I want to get over this, but many times we need someone else come alongside of us to help us and keep us accountable and encourage us and pick us up when we fall, right? So if the help he's not willing, the church needs to be willing to help each other through these things. And so it takes three to tango on this. And so there's been many times that I've gone to people and I've, I've challenged them with this way and love. And this is a, you know, biblically, I see this is the best move forward and, you know, and everything else. And they quit the ministry and went to another church, you know, or said, forget you, jerk, <laughs> you know, whatever. And they don't necessarily say that, but it it's kind of feels like that way to me. <laughs> you know, they're like out of here, you know. But James 15, 19 tells us we can't give up. Remember the story about, am I my brother's keeper? And so many people ask that question, like, like the answer is like, of course not. I just take care of myself. But who asked that question? Cain. Was Cain the hero of the story? No, he was a murderer. Am I my brother's keeper? Listen, you need to be willing to care about your brother. I'm not talking about being a busybody. I'm talking about those that you're close enough to pull the speck out of their eye. You don't just let, you know, some homeless guy walk up to you on the street. Hey, you got something in your eye. Can I pull it out? You're going to go, whoa, whoa, wait a second, you know? And if there's something really there, you're going to find someone that you're intimate and close with, and you're going to have them pull that out. And so, so within reason, it's not like, okay, now you got, I'm just going to go nail everybody. No, that's not what it's about. It's about those you love and those that are going to let you into the life, and you can actually see it, and they're going to receive from you, right? Are you your brother's keeper? I am, right? What if that was the attitude of your pastor? Am I your brother's keeper? <laughs> I ain't my brother's keeper, you know? <laughs> Just tithe, man. I'm good. Keep my salary up. You know, it's not like that. It's about caring about others. And brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his soul from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And I would say, if we change it up a little bit, if you're willing to help your brother grow, you're going you're gonna to remove a blind spot and you're going to create an, an effective minister for the gospel. And you're going to affect eternity through that person by willing to minister to them. How cool is that? God gives us that ability. So we all have blind spots that are revealed in several different ways. Trials through friends or the Lord himself. We need to deal with them and embrace the growth that comes along with the correction. But you need to understand, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. How many of you guys like to be spanked? <laughs> you know? But it's painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Okay. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Let's try that. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Okay, don't look at the screen. Search me, O oh God, 
and know my heart. Okay, next one. Try me and know my anxieties. Okay, so let's start thinking. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. And lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, I'm going to go backwards here. It's not up there. And I know I told you to turn there, so don't look down. I'm just praying, Pastor. <laughs> Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Worship team, come on up. We just prayed the prayer, okay? And uh, again, I really felt like this message was going to bring in kind of, or because of the scheduling, but also just the whole idea that let that be our heart. Because guys, when we compare ourselves to the unchurched, we can look pretty good, right? And we can point our fingers at them, but never change ourselves. Many of you can look at other Christians and think, well, I'm better than them, and never change your heart. But when you tell God, search me, try me, know everything about me, see if there is any wicked way within me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You are so much better prepared to minister to those around you and to pray for the lost with a broken heart as opposed to a judgmental heart. And you'll see what God does. So remember that when you pray this week, pray that prayer and expect God to search you. Expect God to try you and expect God to reveal new things that you need to deal with. And have him lead you in the way everlasting. Agreed? All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and worship the Lord once again. And as we do so, the ushers will come forward and receive of the tithes and offerings. But after that, uh, feel free to stand up if you desire to do so. But also, there's going to be some, some elders up here and, and some leaders up here to pray with you and for you. And um, I would expect some of you want some prayer for this. Because maybe even during the sermon, the Lord <laughs> revealed some things that you know you need to change. Others, he re may have revealed a blind spot. And some of you others are questioning, yeah, I think I have one. And if you want prayer for that, we'd love to pray with you and for you. And so feel free to come up for prayer, and we'd love to pray with you about this very thing. If you're here and you need to recommit your commitment to God, just know he never gave up on you. You just gave up on him. We'd love to pray for you to reconnect with God as well. And then if you're here and you don't know Jesus, we're up here to pray with you as well if you want to know Jesus. And so let's go ahead and spend some time in worship and prayer and giving unto the Lord. God bless you guys.